Welcome to the session on this amazing thing we call the Enneagram. Fascinating, interesting, unusual, funny, and I believe very revealing, very helpful in our Christian lives. The Enneagram itself is a very serious thing, but we are going to have a lot of fun as we look at it together. I'll begin with some fun by showing you a picture of what was called the Irish fox hunt. I don't know how you feel today. Maybe you feel like the fox and you're really sharp. Sometimes I feel more like the hounds, you know. What happened? I don't know what life's about. And that's often how we are. Um, but we come to the Enneagram tonight. The Enneagram is a diagram. And I want to just show you how we got to the word Enneagram. It's some, some people think it's some mystical uh, Persian word or something. It's nothing. It's simply the name of a diagram. I'll show you how we got to it. Little general knowledge quiz first. What do we call a diagram with three corners? Triangle. With four corners? A square. With five corners? Pentagon. Very interesting shape. If you join the corners in a particular way like this, you end up with something called the pentagram. Pentagram. It's a very interesting shape because in the middle of it you get another pentagon and you can do it again. And you end with another pentagon so you can do it again. And you can go on doing that infinitely and that is partly why Pythagoras used this particular symbol as the sign they wrote always on their palm of their hand for their secret mathematical organization. Then we come to six corners. What do you call that? Hexagon. Then we come to seven corners. Well, it actually hasn't got a name in the dictionary, but if it did, it would be the septagon. Uh, eight corners is in the dictionary. Octagon. Everyone got that one. Nine corners. Well, that also hasn't got a name in the dictionary, but if it did, I suppose it would be the Enneagon, Ennea meaning nine. But it's an interesting diagram. Now, if we join the corners of the Enneagon together in a particular way, it makes a very distinctive shape which has become famous, and that shape is called the Enneagram, meaning a drawing with nine corners. Now, it is usually represented with a circle around it and usually with numbers around the edge, a bit like a clock, except that there are nine numbers instead of 12. And each of those nine represents a personality type. And they are these. Number one, the perfectionist. Number two, the caregiver. Number three, the achiever. Number four, the artist. Number five, the observer. Number six, the soldier. Number seven, the fun lover. Number eight, the tough guy. And number nine, the peacemaker. Now don't try to memorize these at this stage. As we go along, I will give you lots of pictures. Just take in the pictures. And then in about session three or session four, I will start to give you ways to remember all nine and you'll never forget them. But one important thing is this. The names are problematic. We generally don't like the names. The problem is that, for example, the word perfectionist, how many feel that's a negative connotation? How many feel that's positive? You're not sure. How about caregiver? How many feel that's positive? You see, all of you think that's positive, and that is not a good thing. Because, as I will show you just now, in every one of them, you actually need two names, a positive and a negative name. And so we don't really like the names. They're useful beginning points. But the aim is to get to the point where you can say the numbers and you know what you mean. Because the number represents all the meaning. The name, I'm afraid, represents only a small bit of the meaning. So we do aim to get to a point where we can just say the numbers. Now let me give you five key teachings about the Enneagram in this introductory session. Then in session two, we'll actually begin with number one. But just five key teachings about the Enneagram. The first is that the Enneagram is a teaching about sin. It's actually a theology of sin. It's a mirror that shows you your inner life and your inner motivations, a lot of which has been hidden and we've been not acknowledging. 
because we don't like to acknowledge our sin. And it's, it's the very nature of sin to hide itself. And so you will and you should find out as we go through this that some of the things you thought were good in you are in fact the very sins that God is trying to get at. And so it is essentially a theology of sin. And therefore, if you enjoy this, you're not understanding it. Because it is actually quite a painful and revealing thing. Now, there are, uh, the Enneagram has become very popularized these days. Uh, in the early days, those who taught the Enneagram in the Middle Ages deliberately never put it into writing because of exactly that reason. They didn't want it made shallow. And so it has become now very popular. I saw one version of it in a woman's magazine. They removed all spiritual content out of it and all suggestion of sin out of it, and the thing just becomes very, very shallow. And so that is not it. It is a theology of sin, and therefore a theology of what Jesus can do in your life. And that's what the Enneagram is all about. Number two is that every one of us is a combination of two or three of these. Now, you will see yourself in lots of them. The Enneagram is essentially nine deadly sins. Now, the, the Catholic Church came up with seven deadly sins. And the Eastern Church added two to make nine deadly sins. As we go along, I'll point out to you which were the two that the Western Church missed. It's very interesting. Things that in the West we actually don't regard as so bad. The Eastern Church recognized those are sins. Those are deadly sins. And so this is nine deadly sins. Now, I am fully capable of all nine sins. I don't know about you, but I'm a big-time sinner, potentially at least. And I can do all nine. But the Bible talks about your besetting sins, the particular weaknesses you have and I have. If you like, I specialize in certain sins. And so, with the Enneagram, your personality tends to get built around two or three. Capable of all of them, but specializing in two or three. Now, some people say, come on, you can't put us all in boxes like that. We're all unique. I couldn't agree with you more. We are all totally unique human beings. I have different fingerprints from you. In fact, I have identical twin boys. Did you know that they have different fingerprints? although their DNA is identical. Everybody in God's creation is unique, and yet we all share a very small number of blood types. And in the same way, we all share in nine of the personality types in some combination or another. You will have a main one, a side one, and a hidden one. That's the hardest one and takes the longest to find out. Thirdly, you can't change your type. You can only redeem it. Now, some people see that they are a perfectionist and they see what it involves and they say, I don't want to be that type. I'm going to be another one. I'm sorry, you can't. We estimate that personality is pretty much formed by the age of four at least and doesn't change. But it can be redeemed. And that is what this is all about. Christ is our great redeemer and he can redeem the personality I have and make it something good for him. Point four, all nine are ugly people when they're unredeemed. And all nine are wonderful people once they've been redeemed. And it's no use saying that one's horrible. As I said to you, they're all horrible when they're unredeemed. But they're all wonderful when they are redeemed. And so you need to decide not what type I will be. I need to decide, will I be redeemed or won't I? You won't change the type itself. And then number five is really the most important. All f nine personality types are based on an illusion. Did you notice the title I've given the series was not the Enneagram. It was the Nine Illusions. Every one of these personality types is based on an illusion. Nine different ones, but they all read like this. If only I could, dot, 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 then everything would be all right. 
particularly if only I could, dot, 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 people wouldn't reject me. In fact, the Enneagram and the nine personality types are ways of not getting rejected. They are false ways of avoiding rejection. It is estimated that our deepest fear is rejection. A baby when he's born has one fear and that is abandonment. Abandonment. And we run here in this church uh, a home for abandoned babies. And the worst that can happen has happened to those children. They've been abandoned. And we carry this deep fear right into adult life as well. Personally, I find it hard to, to picture my own death. I don't spend much time worrying about death. But rejection I can picture. And that is much more live fear in me. And the belief behind the Enneagram is that rejection is the base fear of all other fears. And so this is a false way, or nine false ways of avoiding rejection. I'm going to put up the main diagram again. And here are the nine illusions. If only I could be, says the one, perfect, then everything would be all right. If only I could be needed, says the two, then everything would be all right. If only I were successful, says the three, then everything would be all right. If only I were special, says the four, then everything would be all right. If only I were knowledgeable, says the five, then everything would be all right. If only I'm obedient, says the six, then everything will be all right. If only I'm light-hearted, says the seven, then everything will be all right. If only I'm strong, says the eight, then everything will be all right. If only I'm peace-loving, and avoid conflict, says the nine, then everything will be all right. And so this is all about nine illusions. And I need to discover which are the illusions by which I've run my life. They are illusions, but they, by their very nature, are hidden. I don't realize that they've, they're an illusion. And that's the very nature of Satan, is to hide that which actually binds us. He doesn't want us finding it. And so there are these nine illusions. Now you will see that the Enneagram is made up of lines that we drew at the beginning. What's the purpose of those lines? Well, the purpose of those lines is to show the direction of the arrows. The one, for example, is a perfectionist. It's very unhealthy for him to move towards certain things, but healthy for him to move towards others. So we'll draw the lines like this. Those are the unhealthy lines. It's unhealthy for the one to move in the direction of the four. This will become clear as we do the separate numbers. But it's healthy. It's healthy for the one to move in the direction of the seven. And so it's not just a case of discovering what your type is. You will also be given clues through these arrows as to what you should avoid, like the plague, and what you should move towards, what is good for you to move towards. Don't try and memorize everything I'm saying. Hopefully you will be given a summary of this so that you'll have it at home. Just as we go along, and, and our next session is on the perfectionist, as we go along, just take in the pictures, just absorb them, just feel them, see them, and later on, we'll give you some clues to how to memorize. But the most important thing of all, as you approach this course, and I really honor you for being willing to do it, the most important thing is to be open. Open yourself to the Holy Spirit. Open yourself to the teaching that it may be revealed to you what has previously been hidden. It's an illusion. You wouldn't follow an illusion if you saw that it was an illusion. It's only once you see it. And so Jesus said, the truth will set you free. The truth will set you free. And we need to be willing to see and hear truth. And so that is what I encourage you to do as we go now into the series. Just say to the Lord Jesus, here I am. 
please reveal to me what you need me to know. And I think it will be a path to new liberty and enriched life.